and Mike Lynn. Mike Lynn, I liked Mike Lynn a lot. Uh, he was good to me. I liked talking to him. He was entertaining. But it, none of that stuff was going to last. There were just too many big personalities fighting for market share. It wasn't going to last. Uh, then, you know, Roger Hedrick came in and was not a football person and tried to pretend he was a football person. He's probably a good business person. But, but he had a stop. stop I, I know he had, and he put on the football shorts and had the stopwatch, and that was the dumbest thing he ever could have done <laughs> because even even if he did good things as an owner, he was never going to escape that image of the, the dork who wanted to put on football shorts, yeah. you know? <laughs> but he wasn't going to last either, you know? And Jeff Diamond, I knew very well. I really liked, uh, and he went for it. You know, he tried to yeah. build a team that could win big at the end of the 90s and early 2000s. And when it didn't work, it was, there was going to be a dip. Yeah, he they were in everything. salary cap yes. hell. They went that. for it, and I don't really blame them for doing that, but there was going to be a downfall at, when they didn't win with that. Um, and Red McCombs, I spent a lot of time with him in Texas and his place in Colorado when he first bought the team. And, you know, I went to first visit his uh, car dealership in San Antonio to talk to him. He worked his, his office. This is a billionaire. His office was in the back room of a car dealership with like under, an underdorn table. It was just not, it was like really? Spartan, you know? <laughs> nice. So he did not spend money on things that weren't going to make him money. Yeah. And I think he bought the team just to flip it. And then he started watching practice in summer of 98. And he went, holy crap, this seems good. Yeah. He was like, this team has a chance to win. I got, I have a chance to win a Super Bowl with this team. So he, he put he put off his, I'm going to flip this team thought and thought, okay, I'm signing Denny to a long-term deal. Let's go for it. And then when he got to 2001 or whatever, and it was obvious that that group hadn't done enough to win it and things were going downhill, he said, screw it. I'm not spending another dime on this franchise I don't have to spend. And he, he was very cutthroat about it. Not illogical, but cutthroat about it. Uh, I don't dislike Red. I understood what he did. I, I think he should have put more money into the team uh, after that certain window, but he was just looking to sell. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of fans now have this impression of him as this, like, barking carnival person. And, and he could be at times. Yeah, he, he could be. But I also think you, you do have to give him credit for turning things around in 90. And, yeah, yeah gra- granted. That's the same year that they drafted Randy Moss, and that definitely helped turn things around. But before the fans really knew what they had with Randy Moss, they were starting to get get sort of this fever about, oh, you know, Vikings football can be fun again, and, and we can have an owner that makes it fun. And so there there is sort of this this balancing act with red and he's, you know, he's been very good to us. Like he, he still does interviews with us, um, you know, and always willing to, to pick up the phone. And I, I genuinely think he's still very interested in the Vikings Oh, I agree. and seeing what, what they can do. And so, you know, I'm, I'm glad he sold the team. It's the best thing for the franchise yes. to, to get the Wilson here. And, and they seem like, they they want this thing long term. Um, you know they've invested a lot of money in it. They're going to get their money out whenever they want to, but um, they're doing this. They want to NFL standards and beyond. Really, they want to win. There's no yeah. doubt they want. They want the. I'm sure they want to make money, and they have, and they've they got a great stadium deal, and that's part of making money as an NFL owner. But they you, you can tell they want to win. Um, and they it took them a year or two to really figure out what they were doing. Yep. They made a lot of mistakes. They learned from them. I think they run a good organization right now. Uh, let's think somebody else who runs a good organization. How about that for transition? Oh, that was smooth. Tony Hoagland, H O A G L U N D. Your State Farm agent in Champlin. Uh, Tony's become a friend of the program and a friend of ours. Uh, he he handles my insurance. He handles Michael Russo's insurance. Uh, he's very responsive. You can use his app. You can call his office. You can email them. Uh, you can always reach Tony when you need to reach him. It's just a very interactive experience. Uh, you know, everybody needs insurance. You might as well be with somebody you like and trust and who will get you a good price. Hey, Minnesota sports fans. This is your local state farm agent, Tony Hoagland. I need you all to ask yourselves this question. If you're in an at-fault car accident and you are sued for $700,000, how much of that $700,000 will my current insurance company pay? If you are unsure or can't answer all $700,000, you need to give us a call. State Farm has been number one in car insurance since World War II and number one in homeowners insurance since 1964. For a no-obligation review of your current policies, call us at 763 763- 421-4900 or check out our website at www.champlininsurance.com. 
And uh, so the Wills take over, and you know they they hired Fran Foley, and I mean they hired <laughs> yeah that and, was and and Brad Childress wasn't I I don't want to make it sound like he was a huge mistake to hire him, but they probably hired him for the wrong reasons. They hired him because they thought he was going to leave and Green Bay was going to hire him. You don't let somebody scare you into making a hire, you right. know. Uh, but they eventually gave power to Spielman. Spielman has built a very good roster. They let the football people make football decisions, and they spend money, and that's you know. Whatever you think of anybody personally, that's what you want out of a, an owner. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> there is a salary cap, but they have done a really good job of not overpaying a lot of players that haven't worked out. They seem to take care of the players that they genuinely like and trust and are very good players. So I, it, it to me... There, there seems to be so many franchises where there's this distrust between ownership, front office, and players. I don't see that with the Vikings. It seems like they're kind of a, you know, what you see is what you get organization. Um, you know, there, yeah, there could be some tensions behind the scene occasionally, but in general, I think it's, you know, you've got Mike Zimmer kind of out on the front lines, just saying what he thinks. He doesn't really hold back with the players and. I I think that in general the front office has been pretty upfront with the players about either you know we want to sign you or we want you to prove it or um you know we're not sure it's going to work out here. Um so I think uh you know I <laughs> I always remember like when Mike Tice was the head coach um you know I had a a, a player say to me you know there there are honest people and then there's him <laughs> and they pointed at Tice and I was like whoa that is something else and you know nothing against Tice but I think he he did get into that mode of I'm going to tell the players what they want to hear yep. not really what might be the truth from the front office or even from the coaching staff on mm-hmm. how they want to use a guy so I think you know you talked about Childress I I thought you know, he, he might have been the right coach for a year or two to kind of transition the team after, you know, everything that happened when the Wills first bought the team, the Love Boat scandal, all that, and kind of restored a, an order and um, trying to restore respectability. Um, but ultimately, you know, throughout coaching careers, honesty goes a long way and that helps the longevity of a coach and so you know I, I I think they've got that now that I think that has allowed Mike Tice or excuse me Mike Zimmer to stay around as long as he has and f- for several more years I mean you 10 years at the same franchise is kind of a long time because people tend to you know spend so much time together that they wear on each other mm-hmm. and I, I don't see that a lot here yet well, I agree with you. Uh, let's buzz through some of the other big differences we've seen over the last 25, 28 years. Salary cap spending. Yep. Uh, you know, players don't hold out anymore. Training cap holdouts hold out used to be the only story that you heard about the NFL all summer. Well, you remember Brian McKinney. Right. I mean, he went into October before he was yeah. finally signed. That, that one was crazy. But that also was a lot of the difference in willingness to spend money. Right. Um you know, basically the way McKinney tells it is they were nowhere close to where they should have been in, in what what they were offering him. And I think, you know, he was a guy that was just going to stand up to it, and he did. Yeah, absolutely. And and for NFL players without guaranteed contracts, uh, I mean, it's still not a great deal for an NFL player given the high incidence of injury. Uh, some some contracts or portions of contracts aren't guaranteed. They still have kind of the worst deals of any prof- major professional athletes, but it's better than it used to be. It used yeah. to be br- just brutal. Yeah. Uh, other things that have changed, that just the sheer and, – and I had this conversation with Kevin Warren when I was doing a story on him last year. He said, you know, people think of us as this big monolith. It's still a fairly small organization, yeah. but it's bigger than it used to be. Right. And – I mean, just look at the difference in the stadiums, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I mean, not only in sheer size and really what's appealing to the eye, but just functionality. I mean, the the Metrodome was the same way as I described the the Winter Park locker room, where you're walking in there. It was extremely difficult to 
get to players, especially if you're trying to talk to a player that others were interested in talking to. I mean, you were tripping over bags. You were constantly, you know, saying, excuse me, sorry, didn't mean to be in your way to a lot of the players, you know. It it was a bad situation. Um, the <laughs> This stadium locker room is impressive, but the, the stadium just in general, all of the things around there, it – it just it feels so modern and not necess- I, I don't know if I'd say elegant, but everything seems to be have been done right up to the times, technologically and aesthetically. No, the, the new stadium's spectacular. I've been and you know, I've covered things in a lot of cities and a lot of countries. It, it's one of the best stadiums I've ever been in. You can't compare it to baseball. Baseball, you can do funky things, and you can do a lot of architecturally interesting things that you really can't do with a standard 100-yard field in a rectangle. But it's the best. It's probably the best football stadium I've been in, and the only complaint I have is I, I just wish they'd made the concourse a little wider. It's hard to move around there before a game. That's But that's about my only complaint. I think it's a hell of a place otherwise. Um, what, what would you put as, like, the second – best football stadium uh well Dallas? You know, jerry's yeah jerry's place is spectacular it just for me it almost feels like too big and there it's too texas it's too hey we had had the biggest scareboard had the biggest era thing yeah. you know and to me u.s bank stadium's a prettier place um jerry's place is very impressive it just but it, again it feels like they're trying so hard yeah uh the thing you know, i like about u.s bank is there's you know granted i'm <laughs> i've never witnessed a game or a concert in one of the suites but i've toured the suites and they have so many different unique suites Hmm. and the way that you know one of them seems a little bit opulent another one seems like it's just really functional and cool and wide open you know the the field level suites are, are pretty cool uh where you can almost be in sort of a dugout area if you want to be or you can have seats up above it that go with that suite. And I i mean, granted, I know the Cowboys do this too, but I really like the idea of fans being able to kind of be able to high five a player on the way to and from a locker room. You know, that's not kind of your common fan, your average fan, right. but I still think it's a cool idea to be able to, to have just that close interaction maybe you get your son or your daughter up close to a player and they'll stop and sign an autograph something after a game um there's just a lot of variety in the suites and at u.s bank stadium no question you ask what are my some of my other favorite football stadiums a lot of my other favorite football stadiums there's really not that much special about them they're just kind of designed in a simple functional way like arrowhead it's a great stadium right but all it really is is just a bowl yeah, I mean, there's nothing. They didn't do anything dramatic. They just they just set it up so it's close, so the seats are close to the field and it has a good atmosphere. But it's not like they did anything that innovative. The you know? main yeah, the main drawback to U.S. Bank and you because you brought up Arrowhead, I, I thought of this. The tailgating there is right. is not good. But right. in a downtown urban setting that where all the buildings around there are already established, that just wasn't going to happen. Is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Let's see. What else? Should, what other aspects should we get into here? Uh, well, you know, we both know Fred Zamberletti. He's now the team historian. He was yeah. the team trainer way back in the day. And Freddie is a gloriously crusty old individual <laughs> yes. who loved to loved to you loved it when a player was kind of milking an injury and he could just put them through the paces and grind them into the ground to yep. make him realize, hey, you'd rather be at practice than working with me. But we know that a lot of old school techniques don't necessarily work in the modern era, yeah. and they don't work when you're paying somebody guaranteed money. A lot, you know, you, you got to keep these guys healthy, and I think that the modern NFL training is probably a little more advanced. Yeah, I think uh, I think Zambrelletti's theory was, yeah, to to make them work so hard that they just, even if they remained injured, they would rather be playing exactly. than pushing him around in a golf cart or <laughs> whatever <laughs> tactic he had. I mean. It, He's a great guy. I, oh, I, he's the best. He's, he spins the greatest tales. He's he's so much fun to be around and talk to. But when you can compare it to the facilities that they have here at, at TCO Performance Center, I mean, you have hot tubs and cold tubs. You have a cryogenic chamber, for God's sake, where you can go in there, and I, I don't even remember what the max amount of time. I think it's like five minutes, and you have to be out of there. But um you know they they've got that the 
the training table setup compared to what they had at Winter Park, where I think they were 